Esta noche estoy sentado en el sol y se asombra la sombra de mi voz. Um, today on the um, show, Getting High on Anthropology, we have Samantha Walsh, Vice Pre President and Political Director of the National Hemp Association. Thanks, Samantha. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you, Marty, for having me. So what is the National Hemp Association? So the National Hemp Association is a national trade organization that focuses on the hemp industry. And uh, our goal is to help rebuild the hemp industry in the United States. We do political advocacy, education advocacy, and we're basically just trying to get hemp made in the United States again and to really take advantage of what could potentially be a very lucrative industry for America. Okay, I'd like to think the viewers um, have a pretty strong grasp of hemp, but could you give us the layperson's uh, definition or describe what is hemp and how, what's its association with cannabis that has THC in it? Sure, sure. So hemp is, um, well, traditionally it was the, uh, food, fiber, filter of the marijuana plant um, before, and there was a lot of pharma, uh, pharmacological uses with cannabis, but people also grew the cannabis plant, hemp, back in the day uh, for everything. Henry Ford built cars out of it. Um, it used to be our number one cash crop in America. And then with prohibition, um, particularly everybody was scared about you know, all of the Mexican immigration coming up from the South, people getting high, so they demonized the plant. Um, you were forbidden from growing it. It is still federally exempted from the Controlled Substances Act. They do exempt the, um, the fiber and the stock and the seed and the oil, non-germinating seed and the um, oil made from the seed cake. Um, but however, you still can't grow it in the United States. We are the only G7 nation in the world that does not grow industrial hemp. And, uh, and so that's what we're trying to do is get it back into our commerce, um, particularly because America is the number one importer of hemp products. Okay. We consume 90% of the world's hemp. And then what would be one or two or the handful of countries that we import um, uh, hemp products from? Uh, as for fiber purposes, it's China, obviously. China produces almost all of our clothes anyway, so they produce all of our clothing fiber um, that is made from hemp. And that's a country where, ironically, if you get caught with a joint, you go to, to prison for 10 years. <laughs> mm. So, or even the death penalty. And, and that's what we, and, and, and that's, so that's the number one we do for fiber. And then um, Canada for food products. So the seed oil, anything when you're sprinkling the hemp parts that you bought at Costco into your cereal or into your yogurt, that comes from Canada. And we should be growing that here. So um, to me, it seems very simple. Um, hemp is not a, a product that you get high with. So I don't understand why can't we have a flourishing hemp industry? What's the one or two key obstacles? So the number one obstacle that we get a lot is um, they can't tell the difference. Law enforcement regulators can't tell the difference between hemp and marijuana. Um, objectively, in our opinion, that's simply not true. What we're finding now is because of cross-contamination, the last thing an illicit marijuana grower would want to do is have their marijuana anywhere near a hemp crop. So that people were worried that law enforcement particularly, that you would be growing marijuana within your hemp crop and it's just simply not the case. And so that's the number one objection. And then the other one that we sort of get, um, this one's been brought up particularly by Senator Grassley in Iowa is that they fear that the legalization of hemp will lead to the legalization of marijuana nationwide. And then when you hear that kind of stuff, what, what goes through your mind? I, so, <laughs> usually just kind of so what? Um, but you know, to me, it's just sad because we have a crop that, um, to just go on like a nice wide-eyed extolling of the virtues of the crop that can give farmers a second chance. It is a dry land crop it's pest resistant, um, so you don't have to, there's minimal pesticides involved in its cultivation. It's a phytoremediation crop, so even just using it as a rotational crop will increase a farmer's yield for their crop that they grow regularly, it, and it will replenish the soil. So when you have these 
crops that uh, take a lot of nutrients out of the soil, for example, cotton. Cotton is detrimental to soil. Uh, the hemp will help rehabilitate that. Mm. And so it, that's sort of, you know, the downside and that's what our organization works on is trying to convey that message and to educate these lawmakers so that they don't see any problem with passing this legislation. Um, which the two that we are sponsor or you know that we are working on advocating for to get passed is uh, HR 525 and S 134 okay. on the federal level. That's good. So these two pieces of, of uh, draft legislation are very important. Why? So this is the Industrial Hemp Farming Act, and it's been around for a few years, but this is going to allow farmers to grow hemp um, federally and legal. They, they'll be legal. They won't have their uh, farm, subsidi farm subsidies jeopardize. They won't have to worry about any sort of civil asset forfeiture. Um, their lines of credit at their bank getting shut down, which is currently what we're seeing sort of with farmers that are participating now in state programs. We have legalized hemp growing for research and development purposes, mm. but some farmers who have not gotten a Schedule One permit because the DEA still requires them to get a Schedule One permit, which in our opinion is a little onerous for hemp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Again, it's hemp, it's not drugs. This is a food product. And so that becomes like too uh, onerous for them to complete and they don't. And it's just still a, a factor of intimidation going on. Incredible information, so I'm glad you, so glad you're here. Thank you. So, so for context, when you think about marijuana and how and cannabis, how it's just blossomed in terms of recreational and adult use and cannabis as medicine, do the individuals and groups that are supportive of cannabis uh, for me as medicine and then um, adult use of cannabis um, are, are they working hand in hand to promote hemp as an industry, or is there some kind of tension between these two kinds of camps? Uh. Traditionally, there's not been a lot of tension between the camps. Um, I think a lot of people within the social marijuana use movement and the medicinal marijuana use movement are all supporters of the hemp industry. In fact, you know, the trade organization NCIA, which is probably, I would say, the nationwide leader on advocacy on a federal level, um, is, is, you know, they include hemp businesses. However, we are seeing some conflict locally on a state level because with cross-pollination being an issue right now, the marijuana industry, some people in the marijuana industry, are definitely advocating to shut down some hemp businesses locally, which is unfortunate. And what would be the justification for that? Well, they worry that the pollen from the hemp plants is going to degrade their marijuana crops, which they... You know, there's definitely some science that could potentially back that up. We seem to feel that this will meet itself out in a few years once this is regulated on a federal level for both crops, because I don't think people will be growing hemp in Colorado the way they are growing it in um, Kentucky mm -hmm. or, you know, somewhere where it's a more uh, moderate climate. But yeah. I mean, they will. I mean, we'll have a lot of intellectual property and IP research and um, smaller, you know, hemp going on probably for biofuels, but gotcha. you know, it's, it'll balkanize itself out eventually, the cannabis plant in general. So it seems like you have a lot of knowledge about um, industrial hemp in Colorado. Could you give us just like a picture of the, uh, the sector as it is today? Sure. Right now, Colorado's leading the way nationwide. Um, we've been at the forefront of research. Uh, we have more crop, crops planted than um, any other state right now. Mm and we are really innovating the industry, which is amazing. Um, uh, we, the nice thing about Colorado is that we are trying to encourage this industry. Uh, the governor's office and legislators have been very supportive. They see a lot of potential here for farmers, particularly in our rural areas in Colorado where they really need this kind of help. Um, and Right now, you know, we, we, we're progressing really well. We are having some setbacks with some local counties and municipalities that don't exactly still understand what's going on. So, you, you know, National Hope Association is trying really hard to work with them and to make sure that they understand you know, the difference between marijuana and hemp. Because unlike the marijuana industry, municipalities and counties 
actually can't ban hemp. It's a, considered a matter of statewide concern. Mm. So for people who want to learn more about the National Hemp Association, do you want to share with them the website? And then um, if they do visit the website, what kinds of things would they find on the site? Sure. Um, the website is nationalhempassociation.org. And the things you will find in, on there are, um, we have a lot of member benefits. We have a lot of information, news, what's going on in other states regarding hemp. Right now, we are working with Patagonia on a um, campaign that really explains why we should legalize hemp again and you know make America great again <laughs> with hemp. It's great, it just launched uh, two days ago. It's been getting a lot of press and media. And we also have a petition on our website that people can go and sign to encourage their representatives to sign on to the, um, whether it's Senate Bill 134 or HR 20, 525. Excellent. And so individuals who are interested to educate themselves, um, what entity at the state level here in Colorado is the sort of go-to that regulates or is supportive of the hemp sector in Colorado? So that's the Colorado Department of Agriculture. And because, it, again, this is an agricultural commodity and they are wonderful. They've been very supportive of the industry. Um, they've been very encouraging of farmers and and people in the industry to get started. And they've they've just been wonderful to work with. I couldn't have asked for a more pleasant seed agency to work with us hand in hand on this. That's great. I think people are finding in the um, cannabis sector, um, there's a lot of people devoting their labor to either producing the crop or at the counter level, you know, bud tenders. So um, there is some critique that maybe um, there could be more fairness or better salaries. So what's being done to ensure that the workforce, the individuals that are cultivating it, if these are large farms, like how to ensure that there's like dignity in the field? Well, right now, um, I would say just it's traditional agriculture. So these are a lot of family farms and smaller farms that are participating in this. We haven't necessarily seen big ag step in, which would possibly be the primary abuser of those kind of um, work related issues. Uh, family farms tend to be very fair to their workers. Uh, and there's been a lot of um, what I've seen co-ops being developed in the mm -hmm. hemp industry, which is, you know, very, you know, people group purchasing farm equipment, you know, sharing land, sharing crops and, and processing and all that stuff. And, and that's been um, really beneficial to that as mm, well. Excellent. No, this is good to know. Is there, when you look at the uh, map of Colorado, are there particular areas that are like, these are the epicenters of, of industrial hemp being farmed? Yeah, I would say um, the Southwest area has been pretty good. Um, Sagosh County, Way Colorado has been pretty good. So, you know, a lot of the eastern plains, northeastern, and some of the southwestern area. Okay. Um, the thing about hemp that I really want people to understand is, um, and you kind of said this in your opening remarks, it has lots of different uses. So <laughs> I'm just curious in your own life, like if I go to your kitchen or like to your drawers, like do you have like, are any of the clothes you have hemp? Or like what's the oh, yeah. main normal way that you'd use this on a regular basis? Are you going to make me rattle off all the uses for sure, hemp? Sure. I, I could I take, think, we could be here all day. <laughs> yeah, why don't you give us like your best, the best of. Um, my favorite, of course, is I have a great jacket from Hemp Hood Lamb. They've been in the hemp industry for, gosh, 20 years. They started in Amsterdam, and they, they you could do a whole show just on the Excellent. amazing clothes that they make. Um, they even make a bulletproof hemp jacket that has been worn by Snoop Dogg. So uh, that's pretty cool. Um, I would say that's probably one of the coolest things. I don't own the bulletproof jacket. I would love to own the bulletproof jacket. <laughs> Oh my gosh, um, the food. I think the food really is the best thing that, just sprinkling hemp parts in your food, in your yogurt, um, it's so nutritious. It's perfect uh, protein, has all your omega fatty acids, and it's, it's really good brain food, and mm -hmm. so, um, and it's easy to eat. Okay, so I've been to a couple dispensaries where I'm seeing a broad range of products. Um, there's cream, lip balm. So is the same applied, um, or do you see the whole range of products like that in hemp? Like, could you do creams and things oh, like that? Oh, that's traditionally what it is. So, oh. you know, they used to say soap and rope was sort of the traditional uses for hemp. Um, actually, there was, back in the 40s, they did a uh, Hemp for Victory campaign. The US, the U.S. government sponsored that. And it was specifically so a farmers would, after it had been prohibited, um, they would start growing it again in the 40s, 
because our uh, rope supply had been cut off during World War II from the Philippines. So they got the farmers to start growing it again. That's where the rope part comes in. And then soap, of course, Dr. Bronner's is probably one of the more infamous hemp products and they do soaps. Um, I think the most innovative is the plastics. I was at the NOCO Hemp Expo a few months ago and they had a 3D printing machine that was printing hemp. Wow. So it was printing plastics that were made out of hemp, which was fascinating. And it's very strong. Um, BMW and Mercedes incorporate hemp fibers into their car panels and it makes it stronger against impacts and it's 800 pounds lighter on the average per car. So wow. better gas mileage. No, you could probably fill this whole room and building <laughs> with other products. I know, I could. So let's just uh, take a little break. I want to remind people you're watching um, Getting High on Anthropology. My name is Marty Otanias. Um, I'm the host and we have Samantha Walsh with the National Hemp Association. Um, stay tuned, we'll be right back. We're going to run a little PSA. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, welcome back to Getting High on Anthropology. My name is Marty Otanias. We're at Denver Open Media. Uh, if you haven't seen us, go to denvermedia.org to check out the resources and all the great uh, tools that you can use to do your own shows or to create some uh, compelling videos. Uh, so Samantha Walsh is here with us tonight. She's the Vice President and Political Director of the National Hemp Association. So picking up on what we talked about before the break in terms of all these different um, products, could you, uh, again, if you have any information, what product or new products do you think we might see by next year? Like, is there anything down the pipeline that you think might be developed? Wow, um, I think what we're gonna be seeing a lot of is uh, how it's going to be incorporated into ranching practices. Um, we're right now working on making these stalks and the, and the fibers to be primary feed sources for pigs and cows. You know, people are very starting to become more conscientious about their food sources. And we think that hemp is a food replacement, or not food replacement, but is the new food trend. Uh, a more conscientious food trend is going to be the, the biggest trend that we see um, coming from the hemp industry. The next is definitely going to be plastics. I think that we've reached an unsustainable, a point of unsustainability when it comes to petroleum-based plastics, and that's going to be really big. Um, I think just those building and composite materials and is gonna be the biggest innovation. There's actually a house made out of hemp, a hempcrete house. Um, it's up in Fort Collins area, mm. and they've, they're, they're starting to build these tiny houses out of hemp because they're, the hemp concrete and the hemp insulation is they're about on average 30% more energy efficient um, and it because it's mold resistant and fire resistant it actually makes it a safer home to have in the mountains. Wow it seems like with the traditional cannabis sector it'd be nice to have the warehouses made out of hempcrete. <laughs> I, I, in France they do build their uh, some wineries they've made out of the um, hempcrete because oh. it regulates the temperature so well Wow! and it's good for when you're aging your wine. I know, it's amazing. I <laughs> no, it, it's great to hear you talk about other countries because I really want to focus briefly on the global aspect. So besides, you mentioned the G7, um, you mentioned um, uh, uh, France. So what other countries would you say um, are good to think about as good models that we can look to either for their, their development of the hemp industry or they're just uh, like producing it um, extensively? Well, Australia has been really good and New Zealand about um, innovating the plastics. What we've, and then Europe has the advantage of already sort of being progressive on the issue. And they, you know, they've, they've made a lot of advances. Like I, I mentioned before, you have BMW and Mercedes, which are European cars 
that are already incorporating that, that composite and that building material into their automobiles. Um, I, would, I would say that those would be the countries to model it after. Mm -hmm. Where are the innovations, where are the industrial innovations coming from? And once you get this into, in my opinion, once you get this into American entrepreneur hands, the possibilities are limitless. Yeah, they'll just run with it. Yeah, <laughs> they will. Now, I understand part of your background, and I don't know if it's part of your current job, but um, would you say the work that you do is called lobbying? Is that kind of what you, you, you do? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, in my day job, I'm a professor at the University of Colorado, Denver, and we can't lobby because I'm a public uh, you know, official or a civil servant, but I can influence the landscape on which, on which decisions are made by, by decision makers. So what suggestion would you have for people like me and other members of the general public, if they really want to like get involved or push this stuff in a way, so maybe by this time next year, we'd be moving beyond some of the, the kinks we have today. The biggest, biggest issue is just doing the outreach to our representatives and our local officials, educating them. Even if it's just a simple, hey, I am someone who's interested in starting a business in this industry. I need the, this legislation to be passed. Um, hopefully getting, you know, convincing our legislators not only to support this on a federal level, um, but to also invest in the infrastructure at a local level. It would be great to see Colorado invest some money into this research and development when it comes to hemp technologies and hemp products. Um, we are starting to see some of that come along with CSU. Um, which is the premier ag school in the country. Hopefully Adam State is extremely interested. Um, well, not hopefully, they are interested. Hopefully they come online soon. But it's really that, you know, the, the number one way to get an industry off the ground is to get the academics involved, like yourself. Mm -hmm. So people that, you know, work with our young minds and our young entrepreneurs and who are at the forefront of the research and development to really, you know, impress upon our legislators how important it is that we are properly funded to make sure that we are leading in this industry in the coming years. Oh, that's great. And so I'm lucky to, to interface with a lot of students. Is there one um, uh, dream research project that you'd love to see take off in the field of industrial hemp? Uh, yes. I think environmental mitigation would be my dream, dream research project, um, particularly when we saw that in Colorado, we saw the um, the Los Animas mine spill, mm -hmm. and it polluted all the water. Uh, because hemp is a great phytoremediator and it's a very good filter, uh, it would be great to see how we can use it in sort of environmental cleanup, um, mm. fracking spills, any anything like that. Um, the Rocky Mountain Flats, I mean, if we could, that's actually my really dream area. If mm. we could use hemp, sow it in the Rocky Mountain Flats, and just let it grow and suck up all that old nuclear waste, that would be mm -hmm. amazing. Um, they are using it in Fukushima. Okay. So that's where a lot of that research is coming from as well. Uh, that would be my dream research project, I think. Oh, it sounds great. Yeah. Again, it seems like a no-brainer um, to get some um, information like that available so more people get involved or at least to increase um, knowledge. So the work that you do for many people, I think, is pretty exciting. So what one or two pieces of advice would you give to people if they want your job? Exciting. Like if, they, <laughs> <laughs> um, if they want my job, Or lobbying. job similar to yours. <laughs> um, oh, just stay, oh gosh, what advice would I give to people who want my job? Um, just be engaging and be optimistic and remember that this is your passion but not to let your passion sort of oversee pragmatism. And that would be the best advice I could give. Okay, and that's advice not just for industrial hemp, but I think in anything. Because <laughs> yeah. as you know, a problem I face is we have these incredible students and they leave and then they're unemployed. So I'm trying to make sure that I can do whatever just to get them to be prepared or at least them to take risks and go out um, like what you're doing and really just talking to people, developing relationships and sort of putting two things right. that normally may not go together. So when you go home and put your head on your pillow and go to sleep, is there one thing that you're really worried about or that keeps you up at night about industrial hemp? Um, I think the thing that worries me the most is that a lot of investment capital and legislative priority has been directed just towards the THC side of the industry. And that does worry me. Um, not because it's not an important industry. It really is. I do think, though, that we need to look at the entire cannabis plant and look at all of its applications and regulate for the end use. And I really do worry that we have partitioned it off so much that a lot of this is getting lost in translation. For example, 
people a lot you know there is there is a, a, a uh, sector of the hemp industry that is, um, we'll call it healthful products derived, which is your CBDs, your CBN extracts. And, um, you know, whether you want to call them dietary supplements or food products, it's an industry that's taking off right now. And there's also, there's now a lot of people who are getting very territorial over that. And so they want to have CBD classified as marijuana, which to us, it's, when you get into this, you know, subclassifying of this entire plant, it becomes increasingly pro problematic. And I think that's what keeps me awake at night is the sort of everybody fighting over territory that the entire vision is going to get lost. Mm. And the entire vision is let America grow this plant, let America have ownership and possession of this plant. There's nothing harmful about this plant. It's incredibly beneficial. I'm not saying it's the cure-all to everything, but I think that there's a lot of applications here that are getting um, left behind and because everybody's focusing on just the one part of it, which is getting high. I mean, even industrial hemp is categorized on keeping the THC so low, you couldn't possibly get high from it, which that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but it, it becomes troubling and problematic when you're trying to legislate and when we're gonna have all these new innovations coming out arbitrarily having a THC limit hinders innovation. And so just to clarify, so people understand, is the number 0.03%, is that the number? or is it It's 0.3% on a dry weight basis. And so expand on that, like what's the significance of like, what does that number mean? So the number's fairly arbitrary. It came around in uh, the year in Europe. It was a European standard that was developed and it was mostly because they, there were a lot of, um, strain or strain variety developers and seed developers that had created a they had created great strains that adhered to that thc value um in normally like when you're harvesting ditch weed it's actually probably about a one percent thc level um the thc and the cbd tend to be at a one to one ratio mm. um and and that's Probably that's just from you know decades of acclimation. Right. Um, you have to really specially grow it to reach certain cannabinoid levels. We have about thirty seconds. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so uh, it, yeah, it's sort of arbitrary. The UN doesn't actually define. It just defines for industrial purposes. It doesn't define a THC limit. Got but, it. but at the today, 0.3 percent. 0.3 percent. 0.3 percent is the number which separates industrial hemp from marijuana got it okay so one more time give your website nationalhempassociation.org thank you samantha um, we appreciate you tuning in tonight uh, my name is marty otanias the host of getting high on anthropology uh, looking forward to see you um, uh, on episode 14 coming up uh, thank you for tuning in have a great night Stop.